it's on your envelope that you had getting in. You take it, and after 90 days, if you don't think God's done something amazing, then we'll give you the money back. And we've done literally, all, I don't know how many hundreds, what are we, how many hundreds of, 250 family units have taken the challenge. We only ever had one that said, you know, please give me my money back. And we're sad for that. We gave it back. And, and you know, just, uh, you know, it, it's a faith test. So it's not, you know, it's not easy, but it's a faith test. So I, if this is home, then make it home. This is uh, unto you worshiping the Lord. And we're only able to do what we do because you're able to do that. Uh, and honor the Lord in your giving. That's why movie nights would be expensive if you didn't give, and we could go on down the line. So let's ask the Lord to bless the offering, and we'll worship him together. Father, we love you. We thank you that we can't outgive you. Father, that you're the generous God of the universe. Everything we have comes from you. Lord, without your breath in our lungs, our, your strength in our bodies, your wisdom in our minds, Lord, your favor on our life, we couldn't, we couldn't make the incomes that we do. Lord, it would be so easy for us to just be in a place where we can't even get out of bed. And Lord, there are people that are there. And Lord, we take so much for granted. So bless this offering. Open our hearts to your word and this new series. Lord, would you just do something that, that, that we could never do for ourselves and we could give you all the glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. If you would, put your uh, tithe in there and your Let's Connect card and watch this with me. When it comes to surfing, it's not just about having good balance or having good agility. Good surfers know how to put themselves in the right position. And sometimes even good surfers, they find themselves in the wrong position. So finding that place, they have to learn how to be smart. They gotta learn how to read the wave. They gotta learn how to look at it and assess it and put themselves in the right position. Sometimes just a matter of feet can make the difference between riding the biggest wave of your life or totally missing it or even worse, crashing into it. last way they had the name wrong on there that was actually Jamie Stilson I was riding that it was home video my wife shot those things I thought I'd bring my board up here and uh, demonstrate what survival I gotta be careful because the guy that loaned these he said buddy if you break them you know there is no refunds and no return so these are his babies so we're grateful listen we're going to do a, a series on the art of positioning and I'm not going to teach you how to surf because I can honestly say I've grown up in Florida all my life, but I've never been able to stand up on one of these things. So Floridians use paddle boards. That's what they don't serve. They're just, and I've tried paddle board. And that's, that's, I went down on a paddle board with no waves. So I know that you would not have it a stretch of faith to believe that I don't have the body for surfing. So anyway, we are going to do a series on the art of positioning. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Exodus. We're going to use one of the dramatic, most dramatic stories in the whole Bible uh, to kind of begin our series. You know, we, we call this the art of positioning, not the formula or science or mechanics. This isn't about like do A, B, C, and God will do this. This isn't a formula. You'll learn in this series that you have responsibilities that God will expect you to do that if you don't do them, you're going to miss the wave. God, only God can create a wave. It's never our job to make the wave happen. But it is our job, it is our responsibility to be positioned to catch the wave when it comes. So if you don't have a surfboard and you're on the shore and you're looking out at the waves and you're wondering why I never catch a wave, it's because you're out of position. 
You know, this week I had to fill in for mom and dad. They couldn't make it to a soccer game, one of my grandkids. And soccer is just not something I played growing up, so I don't really know the rules. I mean, I get it. You kick the ball in the goal and you score, so I get basic. But I don't know enough to even shout and get in trouble because I don't know the rules. But I sat there. There's only a handful of parents, and I leaned on the fence right behind the coach. And it was just a joy of listening to him, encouragement, but to position his players during the game. Now, I didn't know why he was moving. He'd Scott holler at, you know, one kid's name. I remember he's Nico because he's like the best kid on the Nico, no, no, Nico, back, back. Nico's dad, on the other hand, is hollering at the co- at his boy trying to position him where he thought it was best. And the coach hollers, Nico, I'm the coach, not your dad. I'm thinking, want to get away? You know, that was a... One of those moments. But anyway, he's hollering at him, move, no, 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 not back, 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 get there, there, there. And it wasn't five seconds later, boom, the ball comes, and there it is right at his feet. Now, I don't know, the, the coach isn't psychic. He's a coach. It's his job to best put his players where they can be the best and accomplish the most for the good of the whole team. That's the art of positioning. You'll never position yourself properly in your own wisdom. It takes the Holy Spirit. He's our coach. And so if you're not letting him, you're out of position if you're not letting him get you in position. So this morning, we're going to talk about how to deal with situations. This would be like the hardest place in life to position yourself. I figured I'd start at the hardest, and then we'll go easier as we go through the series. This is how do you position yourself when you're in an impossible circumstance and there's no way out? Now, you may think, well, I'll never be there. You'll be there. If you haven't been there, you'll be there in your health. You'll be there in your family. You'll be there in your relationships. You'll be there in your finances. You'll be there at some point with your struggles with addiction. You're going to get there. You're going to get there like they get in AA where you learn the first step that I'm helpless and I'm powerless and I need a greater strength, a greater power in my life. So, The nation of Israel has been delivered out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb. God delivered them supernaturally. They're coming out with the wealth of the Egyptians. They're celebrating. And then God leads them to take a hard right turn that leads them into a hemmed-in situation. Start with me in chapter 14, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and camp near Pi or Phi Heroth, or a hard word, between Migdal and the sea. And they encamped by the sea directly opposite of Baal Zephon, which was like an impassable mountain. So the impassable seas, an impassable mountain, and they're stuck. They're supposed to be headed to the promised land. And then it says, verse 3, Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around in the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. See, this is God leading them into a, not a hard circumstance, but an impossible circumstance. I mean, it's like they're out on that surfboard, and it's not a big wave. It's like the biggest wave. I mean, they're positioned in life to say, this is no way out. So God led them. Now, sometimes you get there because your own bad choices. I've been in that position in my own life by bad choices choices that got me to a place where there was no way out. So it's not so much how you got there, wherever you are right now. I mean, yes, it matters ultimately, but ultimately it's that God will design life to get you, and he got his people in a situation. He wanted to do something in them. He didn't want them bringing with them. He wanted to root something out of them. Often God will let you get in a spider's web because he wants to deliver something out of you. There's a habit that's hard to break. There's something you've hung on to. There's something that you've not surrendered to Christ. And God will design the circumstances to get you to the place to do a deep work in your life. So here they are, celebrated one victory. Now they're in a deep jam. And now I want you to see their response. Pharaoh's chasing them down, verse 10. Pharaoh approaches the Israelites. They looked up and they saw the Egyptian. Remember, this is a massive army, chariots. It's kind of cool that we showed that scene with chariots in it. They're marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. This is the first reference to a community of people crying out to God. But they didn't do very good in prayer. And you know you're not doing good in prayer when you're done with prayer and the very next thing you do is blame somebody. 
You didn't pray good. Let me help you. Your prayer was faithless. It hit the ceiling. Bing, boom, dropped back to the ground. You laid an egg, and it went crack. Now you can say, well, God, yeah, God heard them. But what they did, they didn't hear him. And look what happens. It says in verse 11, they said to Moses, was it because you, there were no graves in Egypt? You brought us to die in the desert? What have you done to us by bringing us out into Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone. Let us serve. In other words, let us stay in slavery. It would be better to be a slave to the Egyptians than to die in the desert. What a, what a sad philosophy of life. I'd rather stay an addict and stay where I'm comfortable and stay in these circumstances and slavery than I would to take a risk and step out. You know, I don't want to ever get on a wave because I could crash. You know, you want to play safe in life spiritually, you're never going to get anywhere. John Wimber that founded the vineyard trained us that you spell faith R I S. Okay. Now, it's, it's not an easy journey to follow God. It doesn't solve all your problems and make all your heartaches go away. Sometimes it gets harder when you say, Jesus, I give you my life. Sometimes it becomes more difficult to do the right thing than it would be to do the wrong thing. There's immediate fixes and quick fixes and human... So I want you to see these people are terrified. And they have a rational reason. This isn't like they're just, you know, some phantom phobia, they're real enemies crashing down and they've got no weapons and nowhere to go and they're not an army. So there's real, ra rational fear is worse at times because you can argue why I should be afraid. And rightfully so, their lives are in jeopardy. When you get a diagnosis of cancer, you've got a real thing to have to struggle with fear. When you are in a terrible place in a relationship issue. You've got real issues. When you're financially distraught, there are real issues. It's not that something's wrong with you that you're afraid. It's that you need a better solution than yourself. And look what Moses says to the people that he's called to lead that have been blaming him. Verse 13. He says, don't be afraid. Can you imagine him screaming it? And then it carried out to all the other voices. What did he say? He said, don't be afraid. Don't be, don't be afraid. He's a moron. Don't be afraid. What is he? Who does he think he is? Don't be afraid. But this is what he says. He gives them a position to get into. He's going to help school them, give them the wisdom as a coach to get in position. Look what he says in verse uh, uh, 13. Don't be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, will you'll never see them again. Now, verse 14, the Lord will fight for you. Now, you could put a period there, but there is no period. The Lord will fight for you. What's your job? You need only to be still. Now, that sounds like an easy assignment, but it's, a, it's, it's going to take a miracle for that to happen. Human nature, in the midst of impossible circumstances, doesn't just yield to being still. And I'm not just talking about being chilled out. The word still here means to be yielded to, surrendered to God. It has the idea of a quiet, surrendered trust. This isn't easy. It's not normal, and it's not natural. That's why we call it the art. If you put the title, we'll go back to verse 14. Put the, uh, the title again. The art of positioning. When we go through these beatitudes, uh, we call them ugly beatitudes in here because they tie together with the messages. For example, the first one we're going to talk on in the DVD is Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What poor in spirit means is what he's asking them to do in this art of positioning is get to the place, go back to 1414, 14, get to the place where you're still before God. In other words, you realize there is no hope and getting out of this because you're poor in spirit. In other words, you know you can't save yourself. Have you ever heard this adage, God helps those who help themselves? Whoever made that up was a moron. They might have been, well, Ben Franklin, he was a moron. He's not a Christ follower saying that. You can't find that in the Bible. 
That's not a Bible word, God helps us. It's, it's an Americanism. And he's smarter than I'll ever be as a human, but the wise in their own eyes are foolish to God. And so I don't mean to diminish Benjamin Franklin, and, and I reacted too quickly. Lord, forgive me. So anyway, good, God bless him. But he was more of a deist. He knew God was there, and I know he was somewhat impacted by Whitfield, and I don't want to go off the tangent. Move on. Point being, it's like the person, and don't quote me who did it, because I'm really going to call this person a moron, that said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Whoever says that to their kid, they're an idiot. You've never, you've never had a painful word spoken to you that, I, listen, I've been in fights and lost that hurt less than words that, that wound. Words can stick with you. Some of you are wearing words that you had from childhood. That just stuck on your spirit, and you got to work it. Sticks and stones break it. Words will crush your spirit. That's far worse than broken bones, and I'm not advocating either one of them. All right, move on. So, God helps those that help themselves. What that implies is you, listen, when you're at the Red Sea, what if you preach that? What if Moses said, don't be afraid. God helps those who help themselves. We need a boat. Get a surfboard. How are we going to get across? We need a cannon. They haven't invented them yet. We need a machine gun. Don't know what one is. How do we fight? There is no, you can't say that to people that are in circumstances that are far beyond human ability to self-rescue. This is, when you say that to an addict, and you say that to someone going through a broken marriage, and you say that to someone that's been abused, and you say, listen to me. God says, no, I help those who can't help themselves. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. You realize, God, I've got nothing to do. I can't get out of this, God. I, I can't. And God goes, I know. I've, listen, the art of positioning is not about changing place. Though there are actions we're going to talk about. It's not about performance. That if you just try harder, if you do more, if you read the Bible more, go to church more and pray more, it's, it's not about performing. So God says, okay, now you're a good boy and girl. Now I'm going to take you out of the circumstance. It's about listening to the instructions of the Holy Spirit to get yourself, as a coach would say, still said, no, no, get up, move. I've been screamed at so many times by coaches over the years because I would put my, so I'll never forget one time I decided I would play defense. I decided I would blitz. It wasn't a call to rush the quarterback. I wasn't supposed to do it. I was out of position. The guy caught the ball where if I would have been where I was supposed to have been, I would have caught the ball. And it was a detriment to the team because I thought I was smarter than the coach was. Let me help you here. You're not smarter than the Holy Spirit. If you're wondering, if I can figure this out, if I can, listen, you can, go, look, God, well, part of being still is taking your hands off so that God can put his hands on. He won't put his hands on what you've already got a grip on trying to do it yourself. He won't. If you've got your hands on something and you're wrestling with it and you're going to make it better and you're going to change it and you're going to do it and God's going to help me because I'm help, just in prayers about just God helping me do what I'm going to do. And my own strength. God just says, you can wrestle all day long. You're never going to get out of where you're going to get in. I designed this situation that you're not getting out unless you get a, give up. Give off, let go. You're not going to get the wave if you don't realize that I'm the one that makes the wave. You're not going to get through the Red Sea. You're not going to build a boat. You're not going to get, there's not, you're not going to, listen to me. I've been a pastor my whole adult life. I have walked, my wife and I have walked through people. I could tell you story after story after story, story of people that had insurmountable odds. That they had no way out, no way through, no way. And why watch them position themselves before God to yield and to say, God, I take my hands off. I can't. I, I think of my one of my dear buddies I grew up with, played football with. And after high school, he became a cocaine addict, went through, blew up a marriage. And I went on and became a Christian. And through, through my drug being arrested, I came to Christ and I witnessed to him. And years later, he came back to the area been homeless, been a broken man, 
now he's rebuilding his life and, and working on his addictions. And we were able to help lead him to Jesus. He was the first guy this church baptized when we came to Cape Coral. Uh, he was the first guy we baptized. Jeff is his name. And just a, I mean, he looked better 20 years after high school than I looked in high school. I mean, just an amazing built, just chiseled. He was Greek origin. He looked like a, one of those Greek God statues. I'm just an amazing guy. I'll never forget the Sunday he came to me, and he said, Jamie, I did it. I did it. I said, what would you do? He said, I lifted my hand. Now, I know some of you may think, because you just do it and don't think about it. But he, it was like, he felt his head was going to fall off the back of his head. Like some of you, your arms are broken spiritually. You can't get them. You go, when Tess says, hey, let's lift our hands to God, you might get a finger up. Are you paralyzed? It feels like it. Are you in a straight jacket? I think so. My lips don't move. My hands don't raise. It's the opposite of people that raise them, and they're thinking about lunch. So you're two extremes here. Just because you raise your arms means nothing. But when you raise them like Jeff did, it was a dramatic surrender of saying, yes, Lord. He came to me a couple weeks later and said, you know, buddy, pray for me. I'm having weakness in my left hand. I can't move my thumb very well. I think it's because of all the cocaine I've used. And so I prayed for him, prayed over his hand, and I said, buddy, you'll be okay. Two weeks later, it gets worse, and he goes to a clinic, and the clinic leads to a doctor, leads to this, leads to the East Coast specialist, and he gets diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease. He has ALS, and part of his body, without knowing, you never know which part next is going to die, his body began to die on him. And he took his wife, a newly married, he'd been married a few years, walking with God, life was in order. If any time he deserved it, it would have been 20 years earlier, 10 years earlier, 5 years earlier. Now he's in a place, he's loving God, he's leading his wife, he's leading his family, he's got a daughter he's been reunited with. He said, now he's dying. He takes his wife, they position themselves. You can't tell me God helps those who help themselves when you've got Lou Gehrig's disease. And he positioned himself before the Lord. And they said, God, we give this to you. Obviously, we'd love to be healed. But God, if you're going to take us through this journey, we want each step of the way you to be honored. And every time another part of his body would die, they would grieve it, weep over it, give it to God, position themselves to be still, not to gripe and complain. Listen to me. Prayer is God to bring you to a place and me to a place where we're not complaining, blaming, and speaking with our mouth words of unbelief and self-pity. You can't pray and mean, you're not still yet. You haven't won the battle in here yet where there's a rest in God that it's in his hands. There's a rest in God that I've taken my hands off, that rebellious teenager. I've taken my hands off, that wayward loved one. I've taken my hands off, the financial situation I can't fix. I've taken my hands off trying to fix myself medically, running here, there, and the other way. It's I've taken my hands off, now you put your hands on. Because he says, if you're still, I will fight for you. See, we get so riled up, we create so much dust. That we can't do what he said in verse 13, that if you stand firm, you'll see the salvation of the Lord. Put that back up, verse 13. If you, you, you can't see what God's doing if you're so busy doing what you're doing that you're just creating dust. There's a storm all around you. What's God doing? I don't know. I don't know. But I'm trying. Listen, it's, it's, it's so easy to say, but if you're going to learn the art it's a sacred art. It's a holy art. It's a Holy Spirit has to lead you into it. art of learning to get in the right position. It's not brain surgery. It's not intelligence. It's wisdom. Because you can't figure out God's ways. There's a difference between the will of God, which was to go to the promised land, and the ways of God, how he's going to get you there. And in this series, we're going to learn part of the art of positioning is learning how to discover the ways of God. You may know God wants you to get free from a sin you're struggling with. You may know God wants you to have this happen in your life. You may know what God wants you to do, but how God wants you to do it, that's the ways, and they're mysterious. Nobody would have thought if they'd have sat down and let's come up with a plan. How's God going to get us out of this? 
And they could all die. Let's just come up with ideas, strategize. Well, we could build this boat. You know, we knew that Noah did. And I don't know if we have enough time. Okay, let's write the boat off. Okay, we could go fight, but we don't have any weapons. You could come up with all these different things that God could do. Nobody would have said, excuse me, I think he's going to part the waters. I saw it in a movie. And I, Charlton Heston did it. If he can do it, we can do it. Moses! So, you know, you, you, they had no way. Listen, I can't tell you in my life the times I've been before God. I said, God, I could never untangle this. It's a mess. And all times I've cre- helped create the mess. And that makes you got shame issues now. And, and you know, it's, it's just, it's like, God, it's a mess. What can I do? Nothing. But I'm a doer. I'm going to make it happen. I'm a, I'm a stri- I'm, I'm, I'm going to create dust at least. No, you're going to learn to stand still, take your hands off. That's not passivity, folks. This is positioning where you're in the best place, the front row. He got you on the front. When you get still, you're on the front row to get to see what God's going to do. I don't know what he's, how's he going to do? I don't know. I give him suggestions all the time. He never takes them. <laughs> Suggesting how to do it. It's not prayer. God didn't go, what? I never thought of that. A great idea. Wow. Funny how that all turns out for it's great for you. And it's kind of like Jesus in Jesus' name, turn the hurricane. And we drive it to the next state. Hallelujah. We moved the hurricane. It destroyed New Orleans, but thank God it didn't hurt us. If you think that's faith, that's evil. Thank God he spared my home, destroyed all my neighbors, but it was my faith. No, if it was your faith, you'd have been praying for your neighbors to be rescued and you'd have given up your home. Come on. Prayer is not telling God how to do it. You can try. And he doesn't, you know, it's like the player looking back at the coach saying, no, I got this. And all of your nine-year-old wisdom these are 9, 10, and 11-year-olds. It doesn't matter if you're 50-year-old. You're 7. In all your wisdom, you're going to share God. God, I've got this. Can you imagine the audacity? It's literally like a 2-year-old saying, I got this, Mom. Just let me take the keys. I can drive. I know they think they can do everything. i got to tell you this story. I, I, I was going to figure out some way to work it into a sermon, but... My wife would beat me to it. My, our little two-and-a-half-year-old, he's just a piece of work. But he comes in the bed, and he's not supposed to be in mom and daddy's bed, and he's sleep. He snuck in there, and, and she sent us a picture. He's all around, and she goes, Kai, you got, why are you not in your bed? And he looked at her, and he said, Mickey slapped me in the face. Mickey Mouse slapped me in the face. He hurt me, and he had to go be in the bed. What two-year-old thinks of that? Can you imagine what she, the games that are coming for her? If you at two and a half can think, I got to go to mommy's bed because Mickey Mouse was mean and smacked me in the face. Well, who comes up with stories at two and a half? And we laugh. Oh, my gosh. Because we know what teenage years going to be amazing. <laughs> it's like the teenager that the mom picked up the phone. It's late. She's worried. Why was she home for curfew? Mom picks up back when he had old phones. This would work so I can tell it now. And she picks up the phone, and it's really her daughter on the phone that called. She picks up, and she goes, hello. And she says, Mom, I've already got this. Okay, honey, glad you're home. Hung up. And she had called from her friend's house. Some of you didn't even get that. You didn't have teenagers. If you had teenagers, you got it. If you are a teen, you're taking notes, but it's too late because you have cell phones, caller ID, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't work. She called from another location with the phone. I got to explain this to you guys. Those of you that are online, to help this crowd. But they're like, what did I, what did happen there? Okay. Wow. And you want to advise God? Really? Really? As Dr. Phil would say, how's it working for you? How's that great wisdom working in your marriages? How's that great wisdom working for you? Maybe write a book on all the things I told God to do that helped him out. No, no. It's all the things I did that didn't work until I came to a place of learning what poor in spirit meant. It's getting in the position of saying, help, 
Show me what to do. And so God positions them to be still. It had to do with a surrendered letting go of their hands and waiting on what God showed them next. And waiting's brutal. It's hard. I hate it. I mean, I just, my wife and I had just gone through a, a waiting time. We, we, we looked for four years to buy a house. We've looked everywhere. We started where our grandkids were. We wanted to be by them. We're down in Naples. We're going to pastor here and live in Naples. All right, you let things work through your system. Then we met Alva. We love Alva. I just, I, we would, she wanted a horse, and we're out in Alva. And we're like, oh, we never make it to church. It's a, so we went to North Fort Myers. We love North Fort Myers. We looked around a property out there. No, I'm just, I always hated the red knights. Just kidding. So just move. So we looked all over, uh, just kidding, I was a greenie, so I looked all over Fort Myers, I looked all over Cape Coral, you know, it was like, well, we already live in Cape Coral, so we're like, we were looking, one of my friends said, dude, you're either going to need to get a new hobby or buy a house, because we just look, 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 try to buy it, try to, it didn't work out, anyway, we finally found one, we put an offer on it, we're like, boom, we got to buy it, there's no way we got to do it, now we bought it, we'll know we'll get the Cape House sold, but it'll be nothing, it's a hot market, well, then God steps in, and in the middle of it, he, he reminds us that, well, we're going to have to disclose whoever buys our home that we remodeled our porch without a permit 11 years ago. Under roof, under trust, I could rationalize it. I can do it right now, and it says, I can tell myself, makes sense. Yeah, I don't know, it makes sense. Why do you need a permit? It's already under the roof. It's already, you know, just, who needs a permit? Anyway, did it 11 years ago. Then think about it. Now it's like, now we got to tell people. Well, that's the honest thing to do. And all people advise us, just disclose it. You tell people that's unpermitted. You can't claim the square foot, but you just disclose it. So we tried that for a while, but our it was just tormenting us. My wife to start with. It's always usually works that way. It tormented her. And I was like, honey, I'm rationalized around there because I got this. And I believe in wise counsel. And listen to me. Don't hear me say you don't listen to other people. If you know anything about my life, I seek wise counsel, trust it, value it, go after it. No, I'm not smart. No, I need people's advice. Don't want to do it on my own. And every person I trusted in in my life told me, don't turn yourself in. And it's okay. It's not illegal to disclose it. Now it's their problem. But we saw this little lady buying it in our minds. And even though we told her, and she went to go do something to the house, and she wanted to put a pool in, and they called, and they said, well, you can't. I can't put a pool in because you've got this unpermitted, and now I've got a Well, we told you about it. I know, but I didn't know. Anyway, aren't you a pastor? No, we're not. We just quit. <laughs> That's where, like, Lord, don't send anybody from the church to buy the house. Please, God. So anyway. We turned our, we, we decided we got to get this right. And the Lord spoke to me in my quiet time because friends kept telling me, you're going to open a can of worms. You're going to open a can of worms. And guess what? We opened a can of worms. Popped it over here. The city doesn't go, oh, thank you. You're so good. You told on yourself. We'll make it easy. So anyway, it's a really long story. I don't want to bore you any longer. But we had to hire a contractor, hire an architect. We thought at one point we we're going to literally have to tear out everything we've done. And it was like, God, we're going to, it's going to bankrupt us. But we just felt it's the right thing for us. I know everybody does it. I'm not putting this. It's not the point of the story. It doesn't act like we're better than anybody. It was just part of our positioning, not performance. So we made the choice. It took three months because people, our house, three months, you couldn't, I mean, we had it on the market, but we got this permitting issue. It finally, a week ago, we got it resolved, signed off on the CO. I wrote a monster check to this, this contractor, an architect, an engineer, and, and, and uh, people that have to figure out the, the you know, blah, 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 and the electrician, and the blah, 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 and the permitting fee. It was a massive check. But you know what? We stood before God. We positioned ourselves. Now we have a a home that said is much larger square footage that we can claim with proper wisdom and with with integrity and it's worth more money and so we took target now I'd love which you don't know how bad I'd love to have told this story and say and God sent us a buyer right away it's still for sale <laughs> but it's gonna sell and I've learned be still take my hands off you don't know how many times I want to I know people in the city I've been around a long time. I've been a chaplain, a player. I got I could call in favors. I could do this. And God just said, be still. Stop. Leave it alone. Let me fight your battles. 
And I did. We did. And we prayed and prayed. I could be a liar if I said there weren't times I had anxiety and fear, will this ever get done? And I'm a terrible waiter. And part of positioning, the art of positioning, is learning to wait on God. His timing is rarely, if ever, my timing. He's slow. And when you try to speed him up, he just slows down. It's like the grandpa that you're riding in the car. Come on, grandpa, get in. He just slows down. He guesses that the light's going to turn yellow before it even turns. Grandpa, it's not even yellow yet. And you're slowing gas, but it's a stale green. God just he drives like a person from Ohio. That's a compliment. Maybe. He's slow. He stops at things like, no, it's just a palm tree. Let it go. It's a coconut. I'll give you some in my yard. Listen, God has a different agenda. He wants to take your circumstance that you're hemmed in, and he wants you to get through because he, he not only planned you to get in it, but he always has a plan of how to get out. He just doesn't let you in on it. Because he wants you to wait on him. He wants you to put your hands and get them off. He wants you to lift your eyes and see what he's going to do. But he wants it to be a platform. that, when, Like my friend with Luke Gehrig's, when he said, God, use me for your glory. It became a platform in which God elevated him and his story. Listen to me. They not only go through the Red Sea, they get over. God wipes out all the enemies. He destroys them. Moses raises his rod and says, go for it. Now it's time to move. But you can't move until God says move. And they cross the, the Red Sea. They get on the other side. Look at chapter 15, just verse 1. They state, This is the first corporate song of worship recorded in the Scriptures. An amazing victory of God. Chapter 15, verse 1, then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and the rider he's hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength. He's my song. He's become my salvation. He's my God. I will praise him. My Father's God. I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior, and you could add, never has lost a battle. This is what God does with your pain, your problems, your circumstances. When you position yourself under his leadership and listen to his instructions and follow his orders, he's going to get you through, and now you're going to have a song. And every one of you have, if you're a Christian today and you've given your life to Christ and you've stood before God and realized you'll never save yourself and that Jesus came to die on that cross and you gave your life to him, you have a song to sing. You have a story to tell how he rolled the burden off your back, washed your sins away, renewed your heart and gave you a new song. You've got a song to sing, but I not only have the salvation song to sing, I've seen God deliver me with our kids and deliver us with our finances, deliver us in our marriage, deliver us with addictions, deliver me with addiction, overcoming sin habits and problems. I've got a song to sing. You can't sing my song. I'm a songwriter because I'm living the song. And I can give praise to God as no one else can just for me. And you have your own song. And I can't sing yours, but we'll sing it together and it all has the same theme. God did it all. Jesus is the lamb that was slain. Our songs are never about us. It's not, I am great. I'm my song. I'm myself. It's, when you read that song, you should read it, chapter 15. It's, it's amazing. I learned it years ago. I will sing unto the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song has now become my victory. And I got that in my spirit. That's just an old, we used to sing scripture days song, and we don't do that anymore. But, so, I love the scriptures, and I love the song. And this same song is sung again in chapter 15 of the book of Revelation when they're singing not only the song of Moses, but now it's tied into the song of the Lamb who leads us through the dark valley against the Antichrist and the beast. So listen to me. Here's all I say. I'll close with this. You get him. Maybe you're not hemmed in now. Be grateful. You're going to get hemmed in in life. But get positioned. Not your choice. Not positioning by running or fighting, but positioning by surrendering and yielding and saying, you're the coach, where do you want me? You might find today, could you say today, I'm positioned right where God wants me? You say, I don't know. Let me help you. You're out of position. 
You don't just fall into the right position. Whoop! That's why it's called the art of positioning. You've got to have a guidance, skill, developing, creative. Where does God want me? He'll tell you. He's really good at coaching, guiding, leading. We have to be good at listening, following, obeying. Okay, Lord, you, how do, what does it mean? Take my hands off. What does it mean to let go and you'll put your hands on? What does it mean, God, to be still with my mouth? Where am I violating? Where am I complaining and murmuring and griping? Where's my mouth in the way? Where am I stirring up so much dust by my own self-activity that I can't see what you're doing? I have no idea what you're up to and how you're fighting for me. God's here today. He knows where you're at. He didn't put you there to punish you. He put you there to grow you. Yes, it may have to do with dealing with some hidden sin in your life, but let him deal with it. Position yourself to say, God, show me what's the next step to take, to overcome, to defeat this. He's positioned you for him to have a platform so that you'll sing of his redemption. You'll tell his story. You'll proclaim his grace was enough to get through it. Not I'm big, bad, and smart and did all the right stuff. No, it's the art of positioning, not the performance of the flesh that we get credit. I get no credit. We, we positioned ourselves to follow him, and that's all we can do. We, the, the surf's up, got my board out. I can't make the wave, but I can listen to him say, it's coming, get ready. I want to say to you as a church, it's coming. We're trying to get you ready. We want all of you surfing. We want you to get in the game. We don't want you to miss what God's doing. We want you to go through so that as a church, we sing our songs of victory together. We weep together, but we sing in victory of what God's done among us together. Let's pray. If you ask yourself, have you ever positioned yourself before Jesus as your Savior and Lord? Have you ever said, Jesus, I, I'm, I'm bankrupt, I'm poor, I, I, I can't buy salvation, I can't earn it, I, I have nothing to give, but I need you in my life. And he loves to hear that prayer. He loves that surrender of, Jesus, come be Lord of my life. Just ask him right where you are. It, 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 doesn't, matter. it doesn't matter where you've been and what it took to get you to this point. It's that you're here right now. Jesus is, says, he wants to be Lord of your life. Will you yield to him this morning and say yes to him as Lord? Just whisper that, Jesus. I take my hands off of saving myself. I let you fight for me as you did on the cross. You rescue, you save me. Many of you have prayed that prayer, but you're in a different circumstance. He saved you then, he can save you now. He can get you through where you're at, but you gotta stop you got to stop. you got to stand still. you got to see him fight for you. That's a battle. He parted their hearts before he parted the sea. He had to part their hearts from their own unbelief, their doubt, their fear. He had to part their hearts inside of them so then he could display I don't know how he's going to get you through this and out of it. I couldn't. I, I had no formula. It's an art of positioning that you're in the place that you know that I'm going to get out, but it's only by the grace of God. I'm going to get through, but it's only by his strength. I'm going to figure it out, but it's only by his wisdom. I have nothing that he needs. I offer him my surrendered stillness. I offer him my brave waiting. I offer him my willingness to get into position to catch the wave, but he has to create the wave. Holy Spirit, come and seal this time with ministry. Seal this time with people responding to your whispers. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're here this morning and you said yes to Jesus as Lord, or maybe you did it last week when Pastor Kim and just weren't ready to do it publicly, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. I want to give you an opportunity to stand right where you are. This isn't for believers that are in a hard place. But if you need to make a public stand for Jesus, you've never, you've got to take that step. 
and say, I say yes to him as Lord. Just stand right where you are. We're going to ring a bell and celebrate. We're not trying to embarrass anybody. We want to celebrate with you. Stand right where you are. I say yes to Jesus. He parted the waters on that cross, folks. He's your Savior. Who prayed that prayer with me this morning and you need to take your stand? Be bold. Just stand where you are. I say yes to Jesus, says my Lord. Okay? Let's all stand. Honey, come on. We're going to close with just an opportunity for prayer. Please avail yourself. There are going to be folks at the cross that would love to pray for you. So prayer team, come on. If you went through our prayer training, you want to come help, come on. Partner up with somebody. They'd love to pray with you this morning. If you're a guest, we'd love to meet you. We'll be up front. We'd love to meet you this morning. So make your way up here. Don't forget the booklets for your groups are in the back. You can find out more about groups in the back. We'd love you to come and get some ministry this morning, honey. Great message. Challenging. Staying positioned before the Lord. You know, sometimes that means that we have to get in a place of uh, humility where we'll say, I can't tell you how many times in my life I've had to go to others and say, please, pray with me about this. And that's a positioning. That's a place of saying, I need somebody else to agree with me. And it may not be that you have to tell them what it is, or maybe you need to. But being in that place to say, help, putting that hand out, I need to be in this place. I would just want to encourage you. We have a prayer team here. Look at how many people are here this morning. They are waiting here to be able to agree with you. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what you're going through today. I don't know the maybe pain or the circumstance that you need help with, but God does. And we want to agree with you and believe God and pray that God will get you into that place. So come on now to the prayer as we're closing. Make your way, and I'm just going to close us in prayer. Father, we thank you for a great day. We thank you for your love, your word to us, Jesus. We thank you that you want us positioned just so that you can bless us. You want us to be in that place so that you can show who you are in our lives. We can trust you. We can see you break those chains. And thank you, Father, that you can deliver us out of those circumstances. Father, when it's too great for us and we let go, you come forth in your power and your beauty and your greatness. So thank you again, Jesus, for your love, your mercy that are new every morning. And we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children said, amen.